Hello, my name is Jonathan and today I want to share with you how I take a image and make it into a knitting pattern. A little bit like this beer that's knitted onto a square. Now what I want to do is show you how to make some of the patterns that I used to use that really inspired me, like this grommet pattern or this babar pattern. What I want to do with you today is show you how you can make your own pattern that'll look a little similar to this, something maybe in color. So before we start this tutorial, I should mention that I'm going to assume that you already know how to knit. Not only am I going to assume you know how to knit, but I'm going to assume you've done a little bit of color work before, something like maybe intarsia, fair isle, or duplicate stitch. And I will talk a little bit about those techniques, but I won't labor over them for too long. And I'll try and include some links for you as well, or you can just do some searches if you do get stumped. So just like the beer, uh, I want to reference the jumper I'm wearing right now, which is a jelly belly. So it's a jelly on my belly, and when I shake it, my belly, then the jelly moves. So before I knit this, I needed to make a jelly that would fit my belly roughly. I knew that my belly was about 20 centimeters. Because I had already done some knitting, I had counted the amount of stitches. It was about 22 stitches across and 36 stitches tall that gave me about 10 centimeters. So if I wanted a 20 centimeter jelly, I needed about 72 stitches tall. And then the width, well, I'm plenty wide, so I didn't need to worry about that. So here we have the pattern that I made for the jumper that I've just shown you. Um, you'll notice that drawing through knitting ends up looking a lot like pixel art. Uh, and it's really easy to think of stitches as pixels. Um, what we need to figure out before we do our design then is how many pixels can we use? What is our resolution of our image, basically? Now, I knew from my Jelly Belly design that my belly was about 20 centimeters tall. And so um, that's how I've determined this pixel resolution. I did done some knitting and realized I needed about 72 stitches. So from here to here, my design doesn't exceed 72 stitches. Now, let's say I didn't really like how pixelated this was or how blocky it was, and I wanted my jelly to be a, more like 100 stitches by 100 stitches. What would have happened then is that the jelly might have encroached onto my chest and it wouldn't have been positioned where I wanted, so it wouldn't have really been very useful. It wouldn't have been a jelly belly, it would have just been a jelly on a jumper. Similarly, the beer mug that I showed you was for a quilt project that I'm doing with some friends. Each of us is making a 20 centimeter square. And if I had made a higher resolution or a greater amount of pixels in my design, then the beer wouldn't have fit on the 20 centimeter square and wouldn't have fit in with all my friends. Um, the other important thing to notice is that when you're designing with pixels um, and stitches, that pixels or stitches aren't square, they're actually rectangular. And that's because whenever you knit a stitch, it is wider than it is taller. And if we don't take this into account, then what ends up happening is we knit this, what we think is going to be this image, but it ends up being, ends up being much more squat and squished than it would have been. And we want to stay true to this original design. So we're going to keep our pixels rectangular. So basically, the amount of pixels we use and the size of them um, is really, really important. So how do we figure out what size our stitches are, what sizes our pixel pixels are? And to do that, we're going to have to knit a tension square. So to knit our tension square, we're going to need to cast on some stitches and knit up until we have something that's just over a 10 centimeter square. Now, instead of knitting a tension square with you, because I can't be bothered today, um, I'm just going to use this jumper that I've recently made, and I'm going to measure my tension, or my gauge, with that. Now, if you're not sure where to start in terms of how many stitches to cast on for a needle, it's okay to overestimate and use, um, and use more. It's also really, really important that you use the yarn that you intend to use for your final object and the needles um, that you intend to use for your final object because depending on the thickness of yarn and the thickness of your needle you'll constantly end up with a different stitch size basically a different gauge or a different resolution um, if you're unsure of where to start you can always look at your yarn this is the yarn i used um, to make this baby shark jumper um, and it'll tell you right on the ball actually that most people when using four millimeter needles i don't know if you can see that we'll need to cast on an average of 28 stitches 
and work it over 28 rows in order to get 10 centimeters. But that's just an average, but at least it lets us know something that we've got um, a little bit of reference for. So rather than casting on just 21 stitches for a tension square, I would probably do close to the 31 to make sure we have something a little bit bigger that we can lay flat and measure properly. And you'll want to work that in stocking stitch. Now you could just take a ruler if you wanted and place it up against your knitting nice and flat and count the number of stitches in 10 centimeters. But you could also make it a little bit handier. I've cut a little cardboard square out of a cereal box and I can just line it right up on my knitting here and I can then go ahead and measure my stitches by counting how many are in 10 centimeters. Now a stitch, if you're working on stocking stitch, is a little V, it looks like a little arrow and you can see here how it makes some really clean sort of vertical lines. So we'll start by counting the number of stitches across in 10 centimeters. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. I think I counted that right. So 21, that's pretty good. That's the amount of stitches that the ball suggested. So 21 stitches across gives me 10 centimeters. Now, for the amount of rows it takes for 10 centimeters, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, about 34. So it's quite a bit more rows than stitches it takes to make 10 centimeters. <clears throat> so you can see why it's really, really important that when we're designing in pixels for our designs, that our pixels are rectangular to reflect the um, actual medium that we'll be using. So that's how you measure your gauge. So now that we know our tension and we know what size our stitches are, we can go ahead and start making our pattern. Now, the way I like to do it is I like to do that on a computer in a combination of using this handy dandy little knitting calculator online and then Photoshop. However, you can just do it um, completely analog. Once you figure out your grid, your, your tension, you can actually just draw a graph paper by hand. Just make sure you, you constrain it to the size that you want and put the right amount of uh, grid in, in that constrained size. I just find that doing it on a computer is a lot easier because I can make changes a lot quicker uh, and quickly swap out colors. Um, whereas if you're working permanently in colored pencil and you kind of make a mistake, it's hard to erase colored pencil. So I'll just show you this method. Um, I'll include this link somewhere, wherever this is, gets posted. Um, and this is made by the um, really helpful people at Infinite Loop, Infinite Loop Knitting. <laughs> okay, so we know that our tension was 21 stitches by 34 rows to make 10 centimeters. Now, for my Jelly Belly Jumper, I told you that my tummy was about 20 centimeters tall so I'm going to go ahead and type in 20 by 20 centimeters. And I'm going to use centimeters because I have no time for imperial ed <laughs> measurements. Um, and then I'm just going to double the amount of stitches. So then instead of 21 stitches, I'll just say 42. And instead of 34 stitches, I'll just say 68. And I want to keep that the size of 2020. I don't want to scale it at all. And then I can just go ahead and get the graph paper. Take a moment. Um, and here it is. So you've got the correct grid and you can see that these are the proper, properly scaled rectangular pixels for our type of knitting. And I have Chrome here, so I'm just gonna quickly download this PDF. And I'm gonna name it, I'm gonna name it um, grid 42 stitches by 68 rows. It's really important because if I ever decide to do this design again using a different yarn, I might have a different tension and I might want to adjust it. So I'm just going to go ahead and download that as a PDF. And you can see I've had a few practice rounds before recording this video. And I'm going to go ahead and open that up in Photoshop. There we go.
So this should open up to scale. And this looks great. So you've got a grid here. Might be a little bit hard to see wherever you're viewing this on a phone or on a laptop. And you can see I have the right kind of squares. Now, in order to make this easier for ourselves, I don't really want this white background. I'd like to take advantage of Photoshop layers. Um, and what I want to do is I just want to use this um, magic wand tool and I want to select it so that I'm just getting rid of all the white stuff. I'm just going to delete it. There we go. And so now I have this blue grid. It's a bit tricky to see, so I'm going to add some extra layers. And on this layer, I'm going to make a background layer and I'm going to make it the color of my Jelly Belly jumper. And I'm going to go ahead and use the paint bucket tool. Oops. I chose the wrong layer there. Okay, I can reorder my layers so that the grid appears above the background. And there we go, I have the start of a design. Now another thing I want to do is I want to import uh, an image to trace. Oops. So I found this on the internet. Um, because I don't fancy myself much of a drawer. I'm more of a um, sculptor. So I'm going to go ahead and open the jelly image in Photoshop. I'm going to select all and I'm going to copy it and then I'm going to paste it into this design. Now I want to be able to see the grid over this, so I'm just going to drag it over. And now I can start to paint in this grid. Um, also to make it easy for myself, I'm going to duplicate this layer. Oops. Layer 1 copy. And I'm just going to hide it. And I'll explain why in a second, because I'm constantly making mistakes, like coloring in this pixel here. and. Sometimes when you select things or when you're painting in the grid, you occasionally paint in, instead of the square, you paint the grid and that gets really confusing. So rather than having to go back and undo, I can just activate that second layer um, and then the grid will reappear no matter how mucky my design is looking. Let's just go ahead and move this design up and we'll center it in our grid. Looks about right. Okay. So now, um, if this is too loud or intrusive and we don't want to see it as much, we can actually take the opacity of this image down a bit. That's a bit too far. but Maybe that's better. That's looking good. And now we can go into our grid layer, choose the paint bucket tool, and we can start to paint in what we think our design should be. I'm going to use this little dropper tool to select the kind of red I want. And this is really important. You want to think about how many colors you really realistically want to knit. The more colors you introduce, the more complex it is going to be to knit. But let's just have a go here and see what this might look like knit it up. And this is where your creativity really gets involved because you can see that little decisions actually start to make a really big impact. And when you think about characters like in Mario Brothers and Nintendo, how very few pixels m make up a, a little mustached man. Um, but if those pixels were in the wrong place, it could just look all kinds of weird. So it's good to think about these um, and then edit them as you go. And then I can take another red like this darker red here, I can sample that. And maybe actually that's not enough of a contrast. So you might choose the colors of yarn you have. You might, um, ooh, that's a bit too dark. Or you might just um, choose colors and then buy yarn in those colors. That's totally an option. Depends on how um, how much uh, disposable income you have to throw around or it depends what you've got lying around the house that you want to use up.
So you can start to have a play around with these things and create your um, design. So this is where, as far as I got before I lost my patience, and I thought, well, why not just show you the beer mug that I was um, making? So this is what it ended up like, but let me just show you what I went through. So the process is I found another image online of the beer mug, and then I uh, tried out some different backgrounds to see what that would look like, and I brought in my grid. And then I painted the grid in the correct color of yarn or the correct color that I wanted to use. And basically I have got my pattern there. I could now knit this up using the yarn that I uh, made my test square with and um, using the needles I made my test square with and I could get the same result. Now in terms of execution, there's different ways that you can go about making color work. Um, for example, I mentioned right in the beginning intarsia and fair isle and duplicate stitch. So when I made this beer mug, I used a combination of intarsia and duplicate stitch. Duplicate stitch is where you have a plain piece of knitting, like this green here, for example, and you go back on top of it with a needle and thread or a needle and yarn, and you go back and you recreate those stitches on top. So it looks a little bit bulky, but it actually looks pretty unnoticeable. Um, it is fussy because you're doing it with a, a needle and and a, a thread of yarn. So you have to sort of do one stitch at a time in a very different way than you would knitting. So it can be a little bit labor intensive. Fair Isle is where you would be working about two to three colors, um, but you would never be going more than, um, I would say five stitches before switching a color. So for example, in areas like this, it might not be very useful or in areas like this foam, Fair Isle wouldn't be very useful because I wouldn't be um, I would be going more than five stitches without changing my color. So I chose intarsia. Now intarsia is a method that you can use when you have big blocks of color. So if it, for example, if this was all yellow and if this is all beige, then that would be really easy for me to work in intarsia. So what I did is I just made one more layer that broke it down a bit more simply for me. So I could easily make intarsia with this big blob, with this big black blob, and with this beige blob here. And then I went over it with duplicate stitch. So the duplicate stitch I used, oops, I used to stitch in the white here with these lines and all the black outlines. But for intarsia, this is, the, this is what I knitted first and then moved on with duplicate stitch. So here's some pictures I took when I was uh, knitting my beer. And uh, this is how I went about it with the intarsia. I just made these big blocks of color. I did a little bit of a fancy moss stitch here and I gave myself a little border of moss stitch as well. Um, and then I went back in over here with a needle and a thread of yarn in order to put in the details with duplicate stitch. So what I will do is I'll also include some links to other kinds of color work. I'll include links to Fair Isle if that's what you prefer to do, if that works with your design. I'll include a link to Intarsia and a link to Duplicate Stitch. And depending on what your comfort level is and what your design looks like, you can choose um, one of those methods or a combination of all three. It's up to you. So depending on what technique you use, you'll get different results. For example, with this beer mug here, I used intarsia. And if I flip it over, you can see it's a big block of yellow color. And it's only interrupted wherever I've done duplicate stitch. So for these white lines or for these black outlines. Whereas with this Jelly Belly jumper, I've done duplicate stitch for all the wiggles. And then for the jelly, I've done Fair Isle. And the area surrounding the jelly right here, I've done intarsia. Now, if you flip it over, you can see the wiggles are really isolated and really clean only where I've done that duplicate stitch. But where I've done Fair Isle, that's the technique where you use different colors, but you never go more than five stitches without changing a color. So if you look really closely, you can see all the threads that have been trapped in beneath where I didn't use them. And that just gives you a different kind of result. So you choose a method that you feel comfortable with and you choose a method that works with your design. So that's basically it. You've got all the skills now to make your own pattern, and hopefully you can acquire the skills to knit it up. Um, I'd really like to see your designs. If you could share them with me, that'd be super. 
hopefully in my sharing my sort of technique with you, that's inspired you to do your own drawing with knitting. So happy knitting and have fun. Bye.